I am Courtney Lytle. I am an attorney and a law professor. I'm a partner at Culhane Meadows and a adjunct professor of law at Emory University. I've been practicing for way more years than I want to admit. And today we are going to do the basic 101 course in copyright. Now, normally this takes me a semester to teach. So we're going to skip a few things. The good news is there's no exam at the end of the class. So you don't really have to take notes and you don't really have to worry about each of the details. The good news is also there's no homework, no reading assignments, and I'm going to skip right over the boring cases. I'm not even going to ask really hard questions to see if I can make you squirm and maybe cry. I get so many bonus points in faculty bingo if I make a student cry, but nothing here. And sometimes Scott fusses at me. So no questions from me. There will be time for questions from you. Often we kind of run out before the end, before they need other people to come in and say other things here. But I, if we run out of questions here for que to answer them, I will answer your questions out in the hallway until you are done with your questions. So there is no worries on that front. That being said, our basics on copyright is going to start with a couple things that it is not so that we don't get as confused as we go on. The first thing it's not is a patent. Patents are sciency things. They're the inventions. They're actually useful and meaningful and make your lives better and easier or harder and awfuler depending on how you look at some advances. But this is things that very smart people, usually with science backgrounds, will invent. Okay. So anything useful, your pharmaceuticals, your machines, all of these sorts of things, better cans that hold drinks better, all of that kind of stuff. Those are patents. I don't do those. I am not nearly smart enough. Patent lawyers actually have science degrees. They have to. They have to have taken undergrad classes like pre-med classes. I took astronomy. It was actually a really good class, and I met some football players. So that was the last science class I took. No patents for me. If any of you are the patent type, and in this room, unlike when I lecture at the art show or the writer's track, some of you actually probably do have things that are potentially patentable. The one piece of advice I'll give you, aside from I can't do it, is you can't do it either, and you need a patent attorney. People will tell you patent agents are just as good. If this is worth going through the patent process, it is worth hiring an honest-to-God patent lawyer because the way that they will write your claims and the way that they will prosecute your claims will be the most possibly effective way to do it. The standards are high, the process is years long and tens of thousands of dollars. You gotta want the patent. We're not talking about those. The other thing we're not talking about, for the most part, it overlaps a little, are trademarks. Hey, excellent, would you hold up that can you're holding? Okay, everyone knows what he's drinking, right? Well, at least what the can used to hold. I don't know what you're drinking now, but <laughs> It's in the morning, so it's very likely just what, so we all know exactly what came in that can, right? What's, it, what's he drinking or was drinking? Red Bull. Red Bull. You could tell from here. Now, I'm older than you are, but I can't read those letters. Can you read them? But you knew what it was. Uh, because the trade dress, the way the can is marked, and the word on it, and if we looked closer, we would see other little logos. It identifies the source of the goods or services. So anything that's telling you who made it, what brand this is, that's a trademark. It's not the contents of your novel. And trademarks actually are distinct from both patents and copyrights. Patents and copyrights are in the Constitution. They are monopolies granted by the government to the author or inventor for a limited period of time to incentivize creation. The founding fathers, as they were writing the Constitution, said, you know what we don't have anymore? Permanent aristocracy, established church, and royalty. Hmm, who is it that's always been funding the scientists and the artists before now? Oops. We're gonna want some science and some art, so we're gonna have to find a way for them to make money. In England, copyright was more about printers' guilds than it was about authors. So here we said, no, we're going to incentivize authors by giving them a monopoly over their works for a period of time. Trademark is actually consumer protection. Now, Coca-Cola and Red Bull would suggest that there's actual value to them as well, but the purpose behind the law is to protect us. So if you pick up that can bleary in the morning and don't quite know what you're reaching for, you know what you're reaching for. 
Worst that's going to happen is you get sugar free by mistake, which is pretty bad, but it's a first world problem. You won't get something made with worms, or at least, you know, not worms you don't expect. Those we're not really talking about. Like I said, trademark overlaps a little, but we're talking about copyright. Copyright is, I want to say the fluffy stuff, but it's not exclusively that. Copyright is about expression. Copyright is the monopoly that the author is given by the government to incentivize creation of expressive works. So if I write a book, and my book is about history, there will be some facts in that book. I don't own those facts. If I write a book about accounting, by the way, this is one of those cases you don't have to read, and I invent a really cool new system of dual column accounting, I can write that book about it, but someone else can, and in this case did, say, wow, that's brilliant, but that book sucks. I could write a better one and proceed to take that brand new system of accounting, which in today's world might have been patentable as a business method, but is not protected as a copyright. The substance of that book was not protected. So the second author was allowed to yoink that process right out of the book even the tables, because the courts decided, you know, you can't use the system without the tables. So even though you exactly copied the tables, you kind of had to, or you couldn't use the system. And if we have to choose between saying, well, you got to have the tables, so if we protect the tables, we are in effect protecting the system, we're going to err on the side of, eh, you can copy the tables exactly. We're going to narrow the author's protection rather than risk pulling something that should be in the public domain out of the public domain, okay? So the substance of my book is not protected. This bothers people sometimes because they would like it to be protected. But if I have a book, whether it's a factual book, whether it's a, even if it is one of the Elvis is still alive books, if I publish it as a factual book, there are no fact checkers in the copyright office, but if I say here's a history book, then I don't own that theory anymore either. If I wrote it as a novel, I would have more protection. But since I wrote it as a factual account, I swear to God it was Elvis. Okay, it was 2 a.m. Okay, it was Waffle House, but where else would he be? And it was him, I swear it was. And I'm writing that book. Someone else can say all those same things. Just not in exactly the same words. You can pull, you can extract out the, the content and then you have to express it differently. You can see from that, the next step would be that very short phrases and names and titles are not generally protected by copyright. Because if I wanted to copyright my book, Elvis is Alive, I can't really own those words, can I? Because that would give me dominion over kind of the easiest way to say something stupid about Elvis. And we're not going to do that. We're not going to attach any meaning. So very short phrases are not covered. Similarly, a recipe. If I have a wonderful recipe for how to make chocolate chip cookies, and I do, um, if I were to publish a cookbook, I could protect the cookbook. And I could protect the photographs in the cookbook. And I could protect my selection of recipes, my arrangement, perhaps. If I have really just big descriptions that everyone says, oh, for the love of God, where is the recipe? Um, if I have those really wordy descriptions, that may be protected. But the actual take this many eggs and this much flour and mash it together and then lose count of the eggs and then pull them out of the trash to see how many shells it was and then that, those, dis those instructions, those are not protected. Those are a method or a process. So anything that's a method, a process, a fact, a discovery, an invention, or an idea is not going to be covered by copyright. I have a great idea for a painting. Sadly, I have no artistic talent, so this is going to be a very short project. But I have a great idea for a novel. OK, great. Once I write it down, then I've got something that's protected. I don't mean write down the idea. Once I write the novel, once I make the painting, now, after I make this beautiful painting, after I write this brilliant novel, you can still use that same idea. 
but there's a point where it becomes so detailed that it's my expression. So we call it the idea expression dichotomy, even though it's not a dichotomy, it's more of a spectrum, but dichotomy sounds very lawyerly, so we prefer that word. So my idea is going to be young boy is an orphan, is bored and dissatisfied with his life over time and through a series of encounters with strange people, learns he has magical power as he is studying to master this mysterious force or magic, he has to leave his studies before they're complete and battle the huge villain who is on the verge of conquering and destroying the known universe and or Earth. And oh, by the way, the villain's name starts with a V. Which book was that? <laughs> yeah. Um, that idea wasn't quite enough, was it? It's either Harry Potter or Star Wars once I add the villain with a V. Before I added the villain with a V, there were six or seven more off the top of our heads we could name, right? If you're my mother, which you're not, you, that's a good thing all the way around. Um, she, the first, one of the only exposures she had to science fiction was the original Star Wars movie. I made her take me. The next thing really she saw was Harry Potter on my bookshelf when she was visiting for Christmas, so many, many years later. Um, and she said, oh, I've heard about that. And she was sick. She'd read everything she'd brought. And so she's like, oh, what the hell? I got to do something while I'm sitting here. And she started reading it and got about a third of the way through and came stomping into the kitchen, breathing all over me. I'm like, really? I thought you were staying in the, oh, never mind. Explain, this is just a cheap crap knockoff of Star Wars. I said, what? No, it's not. Well, in her mind, the books were what I just described. Okay, those details that were added to both works that make them completely different, the details, that's the expression. That basic idea that I gave you isn't protected, which is a good thing because we like that book and we enjoy reading <coughs> or watching that story over and over and over in many different settings. And I never thought of those as being the same. It became a meme later, but my mom actually was the first. I'm like, nuh-uh. And then I thought about it. I'm like, oh, shit. Man. But so... That's where the difference is going to lie. As you get to the more detailed expression, that's what's protected. The more basic idea is, has no protection under the law. Harry Potter obviously is protected by copyright. All of that expression of that story covered. That basic storyline, not so much. The hero arc, all of these things that we know and love. The quest for a magical object of a group of misfit um, adventurers together and one reluctant one and one, yeah, that we could describe that quest as well. Yeah, that idea is not protected. A particular expression of that idea, oh, say, hypothetically with hobbits, that could be protected and, of course, was. Now, in terms of when is it protected, we've talked a bit about what is protected. Now, I need to talk about one extra thing, though, especially in this room. Now, knowing that, a cookbook can be protected, but the recipe can't. The actual novel can be, exp can, the expression of the story idea can be protected. The idea or the instructions or whatever cannot. I will also tell you that computer code is protected by copyright. I could give you two or three hours on why and how that was such a stupid idea, but the basics are, even if you are a programmer who is very, very proud of the elegance of your programming language, I think you will acknowledge that your program is much more like a recipe than it is like Harry Potter. And yet, the language of your program is a literary work under the Act. All of the cases that then have the, express that and then try to apply that, because Congress said, oh, we, we, fought, we formed a committee. The committee had lots of really smart people on it. Now, the committee was formed at a time the computers were programmed with punch cards. And they said, oh no, it's, it should be expression. And Congress said, gosh, we really don't want to try to figure that out. So you smart people said it. Passed overwhelmingly. Lovely. Having done that, 
now we're left trying to figure out how to apply it. And that's not the easiest thing because it kind of inherently conflicts. Most of the computer cases in copyright law are really hard to understand. Sometimes they're hard to understand because they're very technical. And most lawyers are not. There are some who are. A lot of them sit up at the front of this room. I'm usually the academic one on the table and the others are more technical. Or we have actual tech people up there with us to explain the stuff that I just don't get. But I would be the one, well, not me because I'm not a litigator, but my people are the sorts who will be trying that case. And even worse, the one sitting in the front making the decision is a judge who doesn't understand any of the tech, I guarantee it. So the tech cases are weird. And that also could be a whole different class. Um, but I just wanted to kind of hang that out there because if you read those cases, they really are hard to follow. Now, a lot of you guys would follow the tech more easily, but the younger ones of you won't because you will have no idea what they're talking about because that's not how you think computers work anymore. But those cases still apply. And the judges had to make decisions even though they had no idea what they were talking about either. The lawyer that sounded best won the case. Okay, there are worse things, but that's where the tech comes. But computer programs are protected, but what they do isn't protected. And that's really the value in them. So although software, they call it computer programs, is the term in the code, software didn't exist. Um, but computer programs are protected, but they're awkwardly protected. What you value most in your program probably is not protected. Now some computer programs can be patented. It is a very high standard on many, many different levels. And again, very expensive and long process. As a general rule, clients have told me that there's no point in applying for the patent because by the time they get it, their code will be obsolete. There are exceptions to that. There is plenty of patented code, but from a developer standpoint, most people say, well, that doesn't work. Copyright doesn't protect the value. What am I supposed to do? Lobby, encrypt. Yeah, the, you don't have a good answer with our existing IP law. Trade secrets, don't tell anyone. Well, you're selling it, you can, so there are c conflicts there. And Congress thought they solved the problem by saying, oh look, computer programs. They hadn't sat through my lecture, so they got it wrong. Meanwhile, we've talked about what's covered, what's not covered. When is it covered? Copyright, federal copyright law, there is no state, fed, there is no state copyright law anymore. That was taken out in the 70s. But federal copyright law attaches to your creative expression the moment that you fix it on a, in a tangible medium. Your computer counts. It doesn't have to be papyrus or paper or anything like that. In fact, if I write on a whiteboard, that's good enough. It doesn't have to be long lasting. It just has to be more than momentary. There actually have been some recent cases about whether the millisecond that a piece of a streaming program is reproduced in part of the cable company's system, whether that actually is long enough to be both a copy and a violation or a copyrighted work. And, and we're talking, and that, the answer was no. But they argued it and appealed it. So if that millisecond was at issue, you know, it doesn't have to be permanent, but it has to be more than merely transitory is again the legal term. So millisecond, no. Whiteboard, yes. In between, but once you write it down, fixed in a tangible medium, federal copyright law attaches. You're not done though. I mean, you are technically, but if you want to enforce that copyright in any meaningful way, you have to register it. So if you have created a work of which you are proud and think you will do something with and actually care about and may want to enforce the copyright, you're gonna need to register it. Now here's the good news. Unlike patents and even trademarks that are complicated and somewhat expensive, patents are easy and cheap. Like, you know, some people you met last night. You go to the Copyright Office's website, copyright.gov. Now, you guys, when I, when I talk to the art show people, I have to be a little more specific about being careful that you don't get misdirected to another site, that it's not a spook, because if you type copyright.org when you're thinking .gov, you're gonna, talk, you're gonna end up on some activist site. If you mistype it in other ways, there are lots of sites that will 
usually register for you, but they're going to charge you hundreds of dollars to do something you can do yourself for free. But you can do the work for free. The registration fee, depending on what you're registering, is going to be between $35 and $55. It's going to go up soon, but not exponentially. So this is inexpensive. How many of you have heard of the poor man's copyright? One, two, a few, okay. If, when I finally get to a class where no one raises their hand, I'm not going to talk about it because I don't want to spread this into people's brain. But since it's sort of there already, I just explained to you what the poor man's copyright is. It's go to the website and register your bloody work. It'll cost you between 35 and 55 bucks. That's the poor man's registration. Mailing it to yourself in an envelope and not opening the envelope. You know what, if you're going to do that, mail it to me and enclose 20 bucks. Because then at least someone's going to benefit. And you're not going to be any worse off except maybe that 20 bucks I'm not giving back. But that's your stupid fine for the day. That does no good at all. I am a transactional lawyer. I don't litigate. So I do not go to court. I do not argue in front of judges. I argue a lot, but not like formally and professionally. But if um, I am, in, I remember my evidence class enough to know that often, and that was a, many, many years ago, and I have not thought about the rules of evidence since then. I can name off the top of my head four or five actual federal written down express rules why that doesn't work. It can never be admitted at trial. It will do you no good whatsoever. Please, please, please don't waste your time and money. If you want to waste money, call me. I'll spend your money. But don't mail your work to yourself. Mail it to the Copyright Office with your check and your name, and you'll get a registration. You must register before you can meaningfully protect your copyright. If you want to enforce it against someone, it's got to be registered. There are lots of details there. My students have to learn them, you don't. Just remember the important thing. Register it sooner rather than later, okay? Now, unlike the way the law used to be, you don't lose your copyright if you publish it without the copyright notice. You don't lose it if you don't jump through one of the very specific hoops. It's a lot, there were a lot of ways in the past that you or your publisher or the magazine that's um, publishing the anthology or any of a number of other third parties or you, the first party, could screw it up and lose your copyright forever. All of those are gone. You don't have to renew it, none of that nonsense. File it once, good for your life. And 70 more years past that. So register it when you care about it. You don't have to register each draft. You wait till you're done, wait till it's ready, and then register. And then if you change a little bit later, you're, you're still good because the bulk of it is there and protected. If we're talking about photographs, because often I'll have a photographer in the room who says, yeah, if you're talking about novels, 35 bucks a, each is easy. If you're talking about photographs, that adds up. Photographers and other people can put a bunch of small works together into one compilation and file it as a group, okay? If, however, out of that group, and there's a limit to how many you can register in, a bu in bulk, but it's a lot. I, I would tell you a number, but I'm really just making it up. But I'm going to think it's like 200 or around there somewhere. But you can register a bunch in a bulk as a compilation, as one work. If there's one or two photographs in there that the ones you know are really good that you're gonna be selling, register those separately. It just makes the enforcement easier. Technically it is protected, but you take away arguments like, oh, well the work's really all 900 of those photographs and I only used one, so that's not much, so I can make a better fair use argument. Put the photographs you care about individually into the copyright. Again, it's not that expensive, it's worth it. Same thing if you're doing paintings or drawings or anything else. Even with music, I, I mean, I used to say this and it was kind of more risk averse than normal humans had to be. I'm a transactional lawyer. My job is to avoid the fight, not win it later. It's a lot cheaper to avoid the fight than it is to win the battle. So I tended to it, 
I send it to suggest that anyway. Fair use and other arguments have advanced now to the point that it's actually almost, I'm not too far out of screen, aren't I? Um, it's almost um, common now to recommend that. So what used to be my kind of out there way risk averse advice is now more mainstream. And um, there have been a couple cases recently with music where that argument was made against you know one song on an album, which I don't know if albums even exist now, but those of you who recognize the term know what I'm talking about. So it's better if you have the one song to register that you know is the hit. Register that separately too, just it's cheap, it's easy, and do it. The process is really just filling out a form. Some of the terms they use will be unfamiliar to you if you're not quite certain what type of filing your work needs. There's a lot of information on the website, copyright.gov, don't get any information anywhere except that site. Most of what's out there is from groups that are advocates. They have a position that they believe and they are advocating. And they will give you advice in line with that policy. It may not be the best thing for you. It is the best thing if their policy were always true and they're not as concerned about whether you get in a lawsuit or not. So any, th any place you're gonna find copyright advice that is not copyright.gov, just don't listen to it. Because I could tell you which group is which and which ones are good and which ones are really valuable on this topic but not others, but just, no. Don't look at any of them. I don't care who wrote the blog. I don't care if they have a law degree. Ask the copyright office those questions. There are a lot of very simple answers written on the copyrights website, they're very good, and they are accurate because they're the ones with the regs and the laws. They also have a helpline. The people on the helpline are very good for how do I fill out the registration form, okay? They know. And if you say, well, this is what I've created, and I'm not sure, it's sort of like a sculpture, except there's computer code embedded in it, and by the way, it moves. And I... Is it a visual work? Is it a computer? You know, and they'll know. They'll tell you what to do. They're very good with those kinds of questions. Should I pull this part of it out and register it separately? Is it better if I do? They can't answer that. That's legal advice. Okay. So if it's specific to you, would this be better than this? They're not going to answer that. But they will tell you, I don't know what this is or how to fill out the form. They'll tell you. And I still have to ask them those questions sometimes. Because I'll have clients come to me and I'm like, huh, okay. A, a trendy thing, which I didn't know about until I had to register one, was um, someone is convinced that a way to make saving money fun is to have a box with envelopes that you put money in, and that's fun. And you can buy a boat. I, 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 I don't get it. Um, but, okay, I had to register a box with art and some envelopes with words and art and some ads that went with it. I'm like, it's a box. But what I'm really registering is not the design of the box or the design of the envelopes, which might be like a 3D work or a sculpture. It was just a box and they were just envelopes. There's nothing about those that was protected. It was the artwork on them. I'm like, okay. Is it a drawing or is it a sculpture? It's kind of neither. It's a box with envelopes and pictures of pigs, you know, piggy banks. And, uh, and they helped me figure it out and it's registered and they're fine now. But like I said, I've been doing this a long time and I sometimes go, huh, well, I don't know. So they will answer those questions. They will help you through it. Do not hesitate to call them. You're paying their salaries. Go ahead and ask them questions. I mean, don't harass them because, you know, then maybe don't listen to what they say. It's kind of like don't be mean to your waitress if you don't want her to spit in your burger. Same thing. But they're very helpful and they're good people there. Okay. What are the rights that are protected? We talked about what's protected in terms of expression, not ideas or facts. We talked about computer programs that don't really fit. We figured out what you're going to do. You're going to register it with the federal government. You're not going to mail it to yourself. You're not going to go to some third party site. You're not going to listen to anyone else. You're going to ask the Library of Congress people how to do it. The Copyright Office sits within the Library of Congress. File your registration. Woo, you're ready to go. Now, what actually is protected? 
the code lists a number of specific exclusive rights. The first one is kind of obvious, to make copies, the copy right. Is see where that comes from? Yeah, we're clever that way, we lawyers. So making copies, performances, displays, distribution, publication, all of these kinds of things, all of the things you might do to your work. Also making a derivative work. A derivative work is something that, cha that is, you know, takes your work and changes it. My novel becomes a screenplay or a Disney ice show. Since the only book I've written is about IP law, that would be a strange ice show, but work with me here. So it, if I'm translating it into another language, into another format, or if I'm cutting up a piece of art and putting it into a collage, or if I'm taking a small piece of my song and using it in another song, all of these things are derivative works. It's a based on the underlying work and it's a change, a recasting or a transformation. But wait, I hear you cry, transformative use, that's fair use. Actually that word in the statute belongs to derivative works which are one of the exclusive rights. So this gives us the unhappy truth that any transformative work, any derivative work is an infringement of that derivative right. There are exceptions to that, in, to that right, but it is an affirmative defense to an action for infringement. So fair use is not a right that you walk around with like a citizen. It's something that a lawyer can use to defeat an action against you for infringement. So it doesn't actually exist until you're sued. We talk about it a lot, and a lot of people talk about it a lot. But if you can't afford the lawsuit, you can't afford to rely on fair use. And remember how helpful I told you it would be to put your work in an envelope and mail it to yourself? It is equally helpful to put at the bottom of your YouTube video, this is a fair use and is not a violation of federal law. I see that sometimes. Apparently it was really trendy for a while. I saw people doing that in Facebook. They would just post this thing saying, nothing in my Facebook page is an infringement. This is all fair use. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> you can think for just a second and figure out whether that's actually going to work. If you can't think for a second and figure that out, it is Sunday. It's been a long con for some folks. Um, if I were to jump into your car and drive it off, yelling out the window to you, don't worry, I'm not stealing it. Is it okay? <laughs> I'm a good driver. But no, of course, that doesn't make it not theft. So saying it's fair use does nothing. Please don't waste your breath or your pixels. Fair use obviously is an important element and it's an important limitation on copyright. It is very real, it is expanding. The recent Supreme Court opinion sort of reined it back a little, but not as far as I would have liked it, but not as much as a lot of people would have liked, so maybe it was a good choice, I don't know. Um, actually, I do, you can ask me, but we're not going to do that now. That was a different panel earlier. Relying on fair use, though, is really relying on either having the money to litigate it. Good litigators start at 600 bucks an hour and they charge you while they're reading stuff and while they're talking to you and sometimes when they're just sitting there thinking, it's not just the courtroom hours and it's never just one. So if you can afford that, lovely, you may win a fair use case. If like most people, you can't afford that, don't use other people's stuff. Now you may be able to and not get sued you can look out in the hallway and you will spot two or three people doing something that infringes something. Fan art, fan literature, fan, or fan fiction rather, even homemade costumes to a great extent. Now the, when you're doing costumes that often overlaps with trademarks because the specific faces and characters or names are usually trademarked as well as protected by copyright. But most of the co big media companies have figured out that if you sue your fans, it's bad. <laughs> and most of them don't care. 
Some of them like it. They say, yay, if you're still dressing up like Spock and Kirk, maybe you'll still watch the next piece of dreck we throw up on Paramount+. Plus. They're going to be happy. They like us to be fans. They like us to stay excited. And so, no, they're not going to sue us for doing that. Yeah, you can probably post your fan fiction on your blog, and you'll probably be fine. Now, what you're doing is violating a copyright. Are you going to get sued for it? Almost certainly not. But if you can't afford the lawsuit, you can't afford to rely on fair use. Now, again, if you put it up on your website, I wrote this lovely story. I truly understand Spock in a way no one else ever has. I have to write this story. People need to hear this. And I can publish it. Realistically, if Paramount sends you a letter saying, dude, take that down, you know what you need to do? Take it down. Their lawyers will beat you up fast. Take it down. There, like the mail it to yourself copyright thing, there is a lot of people telling people, and they say, some of them are lawyers, they should know better, maybe they're just hoping for clients, I don't know. If we get enough people in trouble, maybe one of them will call me. Um, there is no rule about you can wait till the third cease and desist letter before you respond. There is no rule about, well, if they sent a cease and desist letter, I have 30 days from the day I got it. And no one can prove when I got it, so I'm going to pretend I didn't get it for another 10 days, and I can leave it up another 30 days after that. There are no rules about cease and desist letters because they're really just a courtesy. They are not necessary. You can be sued without one. If you get a cease and desist letter, it is the content owner's way of saying, yeah, we found you, and your stuff bothers us. You bother us. For whatever reason, this is not okay. Either, wow, please get a different job because you suck, or, wow, that was really offensive, or we're just going to enforce strictly. Whatever it is, they tell you to take it down. That's just their warning shot. They don't have to give you a warning. They can sue you immediately. If you get a cease and desist letter, feel fortunate that you got the cease and desist letter, not the, pap not the court papers, and take it down, unless you have a legal team ready to go or can get one. In which case, by all means, fight them. Express fair use defenses and see if you can win. Absolutely, and you may. But you gotta understand before you rely on this is a fair use, you need to afford the lawyers to convince the judge that it's a fair use. And that's the practical side of the fair use is a good thing policy. Can you afford it? You don't have to tell me the answer to that. It will vary. Your use will vary. So, we, the individual rights are pretty much most of the things you can do with a copyright. And if I buy a copyright, no, if I buy a copyright, no. If I buy a book, does anyone still own books? Do you have a book you can hand me so I can walk around and flap it in the air? It'll be helpful. Excellent. Thank you. Perfect. Here is a book. I'll put it in front of the camera so they can see it too. So here is my book. If I just bought this copy, I can do a lot of things to this. I can read it. I can rip it up, which I won't, I promise. But I can rip it up. I can burn it. I can have a public burning ceremony. I can give this to someone else. I can sell this to someone else. Used bookstores, totally legal. It's called the first sale doctrine. It's another limitation on copyright, just like fair use. This physical copy, I can do a lot of things to. But I, as the purchaser or thief of this book, have no rights to the content of the book. I haven't gotten any rights to the story that is told in this book. The publisher has some rights to the story. The publisher and the author signed a contract explaining exactly what those rights are. The copyright law doesn't say what rights the publisher has. The copyright law doesn't tell us whether this covers ebooks or audiobooks or whatever happens next that I don't know about yet. What tells us that is not the law, but the contract they signed. But those rights to the story, those rights to the content, to the intellectual property versus the physical, personal property, that's contracted between the author and the publisher, or the author and the distributor, or the author and Amazon, in which case you could just assume Amazon has all the rights and, you know. But with an actual publisher, 
if, it's, if you're a first time author, you probably didn't get to negotiate the terms a lot. Once you're a successful author, negotiate the terms. You have some power then. But even if you're a first time author, first time artist, first time whatever you are, first time creator, the term author in copyright is any creator. It's not just the writer of a book. Author is the legal term for the person who created the work. And person actually is important. That's our next topic. Um, so first sale doctrine tells me I can do anything I want to this physical copy, except make a copy of it. That's not OK. But anything I want to this physical copy, but nothing to the content. Oops. The pamphlet is not included. It's not actually necessary for me to have a book to wave back and forth, but it helps me. About 13 minutes, I'm going okay, to perfect. I'll, okay, one more thing and then we will. Thank you. I've been talking that long already. Wow, I talk a lot. Okay. First sale doctrine with a publisher. Read the contract. If you are licensing these rights, remember I told you there are a whole bunch of rights? You can give away one of those rights. My analogy sucks, and I really need a better one, but I still haven't come up with one. It's a bundle of sticks. This is the legal analogy that we use. It's a bundle of rights, like a bundle of sticks. I can give away one of those sticks, or two of those sticks, or all of those sticks. It depends what I put in the contract, but it's divisible. I don't have to give away all of them at once. I can give the publisher the right to publish a hard copy in English, with these particular illustrations only to be sold in South Carolina. No publisher is going to do that, but I could make it that specific in a contract. Or I could give the publisher the rights to do absolutely everything up to and including movies and ice sculptures and whatever they want based on this. All of the rights go to the publisher. I can do that too. Any rights I give away, I can get back 35 years later with an appropriately detailed filing. There are reasons. I, I'm sorry, I'm fast forwarding through all of the parts of the lecture that you don't need for that. Um, just remember, anything you give away, you can get back 35 years later, give or take a year, and some legal fees. But you choose which of your rights you give away. Read the contract in which you're giving it away. In a perfect world, hire a transactional lawyer who does this for a living to help you really understand. If you're a first time author, you're not gonna be able to get better terms most likely, but at least you'll know what you're giving away. And you might be able to ask for something that the publisher doesn't care about, like, what happens if my book goes out of print? Can I print it somewhere else then? Well, probably under the terms of the contract, no. A lot of books end up kind of in that purgatory, languishing spot where the publisher says, no, no one's buying this, we're not printing it, not even on demand. It is not available for purchase anywhere, but as the publisher, I have the exclusive right to this work, so you can't publish it and sell it either. Even though you're the author, you gave that right away. So say, well, publisher, when you're done, can I please have it back? Often they'll say, well, if it's been out of print and unavailable for two or three years, yeah, you can have it back. At that point, I don't care. But, you know, your mom might still want a copy, so sure. Look at the contract. Figure it out. If you are working with a legitimate publisher, there will be a lot of terms in it. Read them. Try to understand them. If you have questions, lawyers are your best source. If you don't have an agreement with a publisher, if you're doing an agreement with another person who's a normal human, not a corporation with lots of lawyers and contracts, don't download anything from the internet, period. 99.9% .9 of what you will be able to find, even if you go behind a payroll, is crap and is going to hurt you more than what I'm going to tell you to do instead. The one exception is if what you want to do is define how your work can be shared. You're not going to make it exclusive. You're going to make it shareable. Go to Creative Commons, download one of their licenses. They are well drafted. They are enforceable. And most importantly to me, the little blurb at the top of them that tells you what's included is correct. That's not usually true in anything else you find. Don't download something both because it's probably crap and it probably doesn't say what you think it says. But once you sign it, you've agreed to it. It is better for you to write your own contract. If you're going to write your own, I mean, it's better for you to get someone like me to do it. Get a transactional, not litigator, lawyer to do it. 
we will do a better job. But if you can't afford it, write your own. If you write your own contract, spend some time thinking about what rights am I giving away, what's going to happen to them, when do I want them back, what can the other person use this for, what can they not use it for, what can I still use it for, what can't I use it for. If I am doing a web design, does the client own it or do I own it? Can I use this same design for another client? Well, probably depends how much they pay you, right? But make sure you specify all of those things out. And you're not going to use bullet points. Everyone loves bullet points. No, no bullet points. Complete sentences, simple sentences. Do not try to sound like a lawyer, ever. Really, just trust me. You sound like an idiot and your sentences make no sense. Simple sentences, complete sentences with grammar and punctuation. Explain exactly what you're giving away, what you're keeping, what might change that. If they don't pay you, do you get it back? Well, I hope so. Those kinds of things. Just write it down in simple sentences. Don't worry about any of the legal crap. Write down the terms that you're agreeing to, both of you sign it, and you're much better protected than downloading some crap off the internet somewhere, okay? Don't mail it to yourself, but you can draft it. It's much better to have a lawyer draft it, but that's not always possible. So this is your next best thing. Many of you have been in some, in some AI panels, so I will just mention that the author is the human who creates a work. Our rule under copyright, this has become suddenly relevant rather than just a little bitty thing I always do with my students because there was a picture of a monkey and that was fun. Um, animals cannot be authors, machines cannot be authors. The Copyright Office is currently trying to figure out how AI can and can't be used. But the basic fundamental, which has been true of copyright all along, is it has to be created by a human. It doesn't have to be really original. It doesn't have to be really good. It doesn't have to be unique. It's a very low standard, but it has to be some piece of creativity coming from a human. When they finally make the rules for AI, it's almost certainly gonna be a slightly higher standard because we wanna make sure that it's a human somewhere kind of being an author. But we don't know exactly what the rules are yet because they haven't made them. Questions? I actually missed the uh, AI panel. I was outside in the line and couldn't get in. So unfortunately, I do have an AI question. Um, there's been a lot of talk, as you just mentioned, about uh, you know how AI works, uh, like mid-journey uh, art uh, can't be copyrighted uh, at all, really. That's totally fine. I have no problem with that. I've wondered on the flip side, though, where you know Getty Images is currently suing uh, Midjourney over their use of Getty Images' uh, work. Yeah, when their watermark shows up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Late, That's say, kind oh, of a problem. Do it that way. <laughs> exactly. And yet yeah, uh, Midjourney, I think, actually is largely outside of that. I think uh, Dolly is uh, one of the major ones that has been a big one. But my question about this is, um, you know, at, at what point could uh, a generative work created by a system that doesn't really store the work at all, it interprets them, uh, at what point could that be uh, subject to, you know, a, a copyright claim from a creator? Like, um, um, Okay, that's um, my question. Yeah. There, with AI, there's kind of two different questions. One is, is the AI infringing existing works? And the answer is yes, but we've already lost that case in that Google is allowed to make thumbnails and Google crawlers are allowed to go through and make copies in their process of being a search engine. And Google is allowed to reproduce thumbnails of the web pages or of artwork. That's an infringement, but the courts have all have you know, settled out eventually that that isn't actually an infringement. It's technically an infringement, but not one. So I think the answer here will be the same thing. Yes, that is infringing. It's making a copy without permission, but I think the courts will say, but it's okay. The times it won't be okay is when it actually makes a collage and you get things like Getty Images on the screen and you say, I'm thinking you really just cut it in pasted pictures and glued them together. But that's one question is, is the machine, is AI infringing? And then the next question is what comes out the other end of AI 
is it protectable? Okay, I have a question regarding novel copyright. You said, like, one version, maybe some small variations are covered under a single copyright. Wait till you're done writing. It, is that done writing ready to submit Just for to publishers? Yes. Remember, it's technically covered as soon as it's written down. So your protection begins when it's written down. Your protection isn't really worth anything until you file it. So before you send it to publishers, send it to the copyright office. Okay, and then, and then the publishing edit it, editing process. It, either they will want you to refile it or most likely not. Oh, one thing, if you're sending it to publishers, I do not understand why this is because my advice is right at the bottom of your work, the little C with a circle and your name. It's not required. It used to be, it is not any longer. You don't have to do that. It doesn't keep people from stealing, but it does at least let them know that you think there's a copyright. They shouldn't steal it. If you're submitting your novel to a publisher, don't put the copyright notice on it. It pisses them off to no end. I have no idea why. I have asked them, and they have looked at me and said, because it just means that you're a jerk and you're presumptuous. And it's like, or you've got legitimate advice from your counsel. And they went, oh, you mean like the same person that I'm paying to give me legitimate advice? I'm like, yeah, her. They're like, oh. Yeah, but I still don't like it when they do that. So if you want the publisher to like your work, don't put the copyright notice on it. I don't know why. It makes no sense. It is, however, the truth. And you're trying to get them to take your book. So don't piss them off first. You know, don't have the waiter spit in your drink, all these things. Don't ask the publisher to spit in your drink by putting the copyright symbol. I don't understand it, but I acknowledge it as reality. Yeah, a uh, real basic question potentially. Putting it into example, you mentioned software. So you got Microsoft Office, and then you've got things like OpenOffice and Google Drive, Google Docs. Like they all, even the layout is the same and the functionality is the same. So how does copyright work with those? Copyright only covers the expression. So okay. the functional layout, mm -hmm. the, maybe the colors are protected, maybe the way it's laid out. But if the layout or the words we're using are functional, it's not protected by copyright which pisses okay. all the software developers off. Also, your relationship with Microsoft or with Google Works or whichever of those systems you're working is not really covered by copyright. It's covered by that license you agreed to when you opened the box or clicked I agree. So your, the limits of your interaction with that software is not covered by the law. It's covered by the license, by the contract. And you clicked a box and you agreed. It used to be a shrink wrap license, meaning when you opened the shrink wrap on the box, ha, you agreed. Um, that thing that fell out was the warranty. The limits were something you agreed to. You get, you have to, you know, Bill Gates' towel boy. Those kinds of things. It's in there. Um, so the terms of the contract. Now it's, we still call it clickware because we think that's clever because it was shrink wrap and now it's click wrap. Um, and so it's a click wrap agreement. But when you clicked I agree, that's actually legally enforceable and you just told Microsoft what you can and can't do with your software. Uh, this is getting kind of noodly, uh, so apologies. But uh, I also play Dungeons and Dragons, as a lot of people here probably do. Um, I know it's it's shocking, uh, but <laughs> it's it's shocking. It's so niche. Uh, but uh, they recently had a, a big debacle about uh, the OGL, uh, and there was some uh, really uh, funny, you know, outgrowths from that. <laughs> it was it was really a. a, a a real stinker. It was it was very bad. Yeah. Uh, my my question though is about um, uh, again the the question about ideas and expression because in a lot of that the discussion was about game mechanics and the the common refrain was well you can't you know copyright game mechanics and and right and so that seems to be you know legally sound. The other flip side of that is that I was hearing people say yes, but do you actually want to test that? You know, could could you get to the other side of a case with that and potentially see you know somebody flip that on its head and say, okay, but actually in this case we actually you know own well, again, these mechanics. Most likely, with in that situation with the game, you most likely agree to a license, and so it's not can you afford the copyright suit or could you win the copyright suit, but could you somehow convince a court that even though you are blatantly violating the terms of the license to which you agreed, that somehow that's okay for you. But the mechanics of a game are not protectable. Some of them can be patented, but game mechanics can't. But the look, the feel, 
the expression, the words, the stories. That's why a lot of games, um, okay, a lot of games have long kind of clever instructions rather than just tell me how to play, but they have game instructions. And you think, yeah, yeah, that was cute the first time I read it, but I'm still trying to remember when you draw a card, I have to read five pages of story. Um, it either is because they just like to hear themselves type and they think they're clever, or the lawyers suggested to you that if you put those instructions in a story, more of it's protected. So I don't know which it is, but if you embed the information in a story, you've got more protection because the story is going to be protected. But if I just pull those game mechanics out, copyright will not protect them. If you put I agree at some point, then you've agreed to give them more rights. And we're done. Don't forget to rate your panels. Thank you, everybody.